Good evening and happy Sabbath to all. Indeed, we are blessed that we are together again to worship God in spirit and in truth. To all brothers and sisters joining and worshiping with us through Facebook and YouTube, we welcome you all. Happy Sabbath. As we continue our worship, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. We seek for your presence. We seek for your guidance. Empower us, Lord, with the impression of the Holy Spirit. May our worship be acceptable before your throne of grace and mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, happy Sabbath to all. Oh 
Hi, Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I invite you to open your Bibles uh, on Hebrews 11, verse chapter 11, verse 13 to 16. And I read, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. We are assured of them, embrace them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, and that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, a pastor encountered three young boys, and after the conversation, the pastor asked them, Do you want to go to heaven? Not me, said one. The pastor was shocked. You don't want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, when I die? Yeah, sure, the boy replied. I thought you were getting up a group to go right now. Now, most of us are probably, most of us probably share that boy's feeling about heaven. Someday, it would be nice to go there, but at the moment, we're not interested. It's just too nice here on earth. Besides, if we were honest, we'd probably admit that heaven seems a bit boring. There's a comic strip that I, before that I, that comes into my mind, that they painted the, us when we go to heaven, that we have wings and white robes and with halos and that we are sitting alone and that uh, we wish we brought a magazine or a smartphone. But the author of Hebrews counters this uh, disinterested views of heaven by showing us that rather than settling in and feeling comfortable here on earth, believers feel out of place. They confess that they are strangers and exiles on the earth, on verse 13. And rather than viewing heaven as a nice extra, after we enjoy the good life here below, it shows that the believers are longing, are desiring for a better country, are longing for heaven as says on chapter uh, verse 16, our text teaches us that we who lived and died according to faith are exiles here on earth, desiring a better country, a better place in heaven. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for the beautiful week that we had. And now as we welcome Sabbath, as we study your word, be with us. In Christ's name pray. Amen. Now, there's a hymn uh, that was given uh, that was written by uh, Henry Francis Light. I don't know the, the tune of it, but it says, It is not for me to be seeking my bliss and building my hopes in a region like this. I look for a city which have had not piled. I pant for a country by sin undefiled. It is safe to say that in our day, our emphasis is far too much on the good life here. The good life here and now, and not enough in the promised joys of heaven. Thus many profess Christ as Savior lived with their minds on the things on earth rather than settling their minds on the things above, just as said in Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. They are motivated by collecting treasures on earth, rather than by storing up treasures in heaven. Our focus is on what Christ can do for us here and now. Um, we pray to God that uh, we might get this job, or we pray to God that we might uh, have a good family, a good marriage life, Though heaven is a, nice, is a nice extra, but it does not govern how we live day to day. 
but it should. As we've seen in the first, uh, as we have seen in the first readers of this episode, epistle were tempted under the threat of persecution to go back to the Jewish re uh, religion. Now, the implication here in our text, in the context of this, that going back to Judo uh, Judaism would, is like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob going back permanently to the Mesopotamia. And not uh, God has promised them a new country, the land of Canaan, but since they want to they don't want to deal with the hardship that the the new land is uh, is gonna bring them they would just go back to from where they came from from their old country which is mesopotamia and i'm sure that is a comfortable place they have a house they have a bed not that not here in uh, in the promised land wherein they live in a tent but being men of faith they look beyond that piece of real estate to the heavenly country that God prepared, uh, prepared for them. They all died according to faith, literally. They all died according to faith. Now, faith was the dominant characteristics of their lives, right up to the point of death. None of them, remember, none of them realized the promise, the promise of the land of Canaan. Abraham Isaac didn't get to uh, didn't get to settle uh, in the land of Canaan. None of them live up uh, were alive for the promise of innumerable descendants, where they were promised to have uh, uh, descendants as many as the stars in the sky. Or none of them uh, live to that. They view themselves as strangers and exiles on earth. If they had doubted God's promise they could have gone back to their homeland. But as it is, they desire a better country, on, uh, verse 16, that is a heavenly one. And so they died well. They died well according to their, uh, according to their faith in a yet unfulfilled, unseen promise of God. As such, they are examples in how to live and die according to faith as exiles here on earth. And while we pant after a better country in heaven, our text here has two main points. Number one is uh, the verses 13 to 15, and the other one is the verses 16. Number one is we live and die according to the faith of strangers, uh, are strangers and exiles on this earth. Now, these men of faith confess that they are strangers and exiles on earth. Now, this refer when uh, Abram was looking for a burial path for Sarah, when he said on Genesis 23, verse 4, that I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. And when Jacob was uh, near at the end of his life, he met Pharaoh and he twice referred to his life as a uh, Sojourner, a traveler. Our text brings us three aspects of this pilgrim life. That strangers and exiles on earth seem and welcome God's promises from a distance. Now, there are four implications of this sentence, of this verse. Number one is we must see God's promises. Before we can believe in God's promises, we must see them. Before we can see them, God must open our spiritual blind eyes. As Paul explained on the 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of Christ. Chapter uh, verse 6, he continued that in order for us to see the spiritual truth, the God who said, let light shall shine, light shall shine out of darkness, has to shine in our hearts and to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Faith, which is the gift of God, enable us to prove the things not seen as stated in uh, Hebrews uh, 11, verse 1. Faith enables us to prove 
the things not seen by bringing them into our uh, present experience in this way like a uh, in John 8, 5, 6, Jesus said to the Pharisees at that time that Abraham rejoiced when he saw Jesus' day. Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day, and he saw it and was glad. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ begins when God opens your eyes to see his promise of eternal life. The promise of eternal life that stated on John three sixteen. We must also welcome God's promises. Having seen God's promises, the patriarchs welcomed them. They greeted them. They embraced them. The, uh, the, the Filipinos are known for their hospitality. We give everything when we have visitors. We put out the new ones, the new dishes, the new, the new things. We put it out. And we must be like that, just what have uh, Abraham or uh, the patriarchs have done when they welcomed the three strangers into their tent. They greeted God's promises with open arms. They brought God's promises into their lives as gladly as they welcomed the guests on their tents, into their tents. Now, have you done that? Have we welcomed Jesus Christ into, into our life as a Savior and Lord? Have we embraced him as you would, uh, as you would in a, as you would a long lost friend? If God has opened your eyes to your true condition as a guilty sinner before Him, and the glory of the Savior who bore that penalty you deserve, then you should rush to welcome Him warmly into your life. We can only see and welcome the promises from a distance. Now, what does this mean? It amplifies the opening phrase uh, of the verse that these men died in faith without receiving the promises. But Hebrews 6, uh, chapter, but uh, 615 states, Havingly, uh, having patiently waited, Abraham obtained the promise. And also Hebrews 11 verse 17 says that Abraham have received the promise. So in what sense did he receive the promises or receive them at a distance? The author means that the patriarch did not receive the total fulfillment of God's promises in their life. They only received the taste of them. The, uh, Abraham and Sarah finally received a promise of a son in Isaac, but Abraham died with only two years, according to the promise. According to the promise, so he will have uh, innumerable descendants, but they died with only two years, Isaac and Jacob. It's hardly innumerable nation. Isaac owned a few wells plus some grazing land or flats, but he still lived in a tent and was not in, a, in any significant way was the heir to the land. Jacob died about 70 descendants, including his sons, who became the patriarch of the 12 tribes. But they were forced to move out of the land into Egypt because of the family, of the famine. So the patriarch had a taste of fulfillment of that promise, but they only welcomed them from a distance. It is same, the same is true for all of us believers. God promised us eternal life. Yet, like the patriarchs, we all die unless we are alive when the Lord returns. The world scoff at this epitaph in uh, Hebrews eleven thirteen. All these died in faith. What a joke. That's a pie in the sky when you die. It Meaning it's an empty promise. There's nothing in there. The world uh, says that I want, uh, I want cash in a stash here and now, not a pie in the sky when I die. The world is uh, focused on these material things that they want what is here. They want to hold it. They want to see it. Not, not when we, not of the promises of that, uh, you know, if it happens, it happens or may not. But C.S. Lewis observed, the, uh, Lewis observed, and he says then on his book, uh, The Prophet, uh, The Problem of Pain, Scripture habitually put the joys of heaven into the scale against the suffering of earth. 
and no solution of the problem of pain which does not uh, which does not do so can be called a Christian one. We are very shy nowadays of even mentioning heaven. We are afraid of the jeer about the pie in the sky. But either there is a pie in the sky or there is not. If there is not, then Christianity is false. If this doctrine is woven into this whole fabric. So we must see and welcome God's promises. Although we can only do this in this life from a distance. Seeing and welcoming God's promises basically uh, alienate, uh, alienates us from the world, from this world. The reason that Abraham left his homeland and migrated to Canaan was that he had seen and welcomed the God's promises. If he had ignored God's promises, he would have continued to live his life in his native land, where he blended with everyone else, and life goes on. Nothing, nothing will happen. But because he believed God and obeyed his call, he went out from his family and friends and lived as a foreigner, as an alien in the land of promise. As in, in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Seeing and welcoming God's promises disrupted the rest of Abraham's life on this earth. Instead of blending in, he was, he was different now. People stood and stared at them when they journeyed past the villages of Canaan. And when they pitched their tent outside the town, they, I can, it is safe to say that uh, people are asking, who are they? Where did they come from? Why did they look different? Why are they here? Why do they want from us? What do they want from us? And maybe the mothers are telling their children that be careful around them. They might be dangerous. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt an outsider? When me and Karen uh, went for our vacation, we went to, to Prague, uh, to Eastern Europe. We tried to blend in. Before going there, we, we researched what we're gonna, what we're gonna wear so that we blend in. But as much as uh, we tried to blend in, we still stand out because we are different. We don't speak their language. We can't read the signs, the newspaper. They use different money. We don't share customs with them. We visited their church uh, on a Saturday. And even though we are fellow Adventists and they are trying to be to be hospitable, they're trying to make us feel welcome, but still, we feel that you're a stranger. As Christians, we're supposed to feel that way living in this evil world. We shouldn't fit in. The world pursues different goals and pleasures than we do. The world laughs at jokes and scenes from movies that we find repugnant. The world lives for this life only, but we live for we, uh, we live uh, in the light of eternity. The world lives as if there is no God, but we live to please God, who knows who our every thought and motive. The world should not be able to understand us because we think, act, and live differently than they do. Strangers and exiles on this earth have the opportunity to tell others about our homeland. The patriarch confessed that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. For those who say such thing, they make it clear that they are seeking the country of their own. Now confess, in a, on a verse 13, confess means uh, it refers to the speech. Make it clear or to exhibit it, it refers to the lifestyle, the nuance of lifestyle or behavior. And the country means the fatherland or homeland. As Paul explained in uh, uh, Philippians 3, 19 to 20, we are not like those whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Rather, we are, our citizenship is in heaven. 
Since we come from a different country, we talk and act differently than the natives of this world do. And when they observe that we are different, we should be ready to tell them why. Tell them about God's promises of heaven for all that believe in Christ, so that you can join us as pilgrims journey towards our new country in heaven. The author, uh, the str uh, strangers and uh, foreigners of this earth cannot move back to their own, uh, to their former country. The author is writing to people who were encountering hardship in their life as a new Christians. They were tempted back to go back to their old religion. It's, uh, so he pointed out the patriarchs could have returned to Mesopotamia. You know, Mesopotamia is the cradle of civilization. During that time, it is, the, it is a first world country. So for sure, it is comfortable there. The living condition of this former homeland were probably more developed than the land of Canaan. If they have returned, their family and friends would welcome them with open arms. Whereas in Canaan, they were kept at a distance, but they endured hardship and didn't go back because they were seeking a better country, namely the heavenly one. To the extent that when Abraham sent servants back to the old country to get a bride for Isaac, in Genesis 24, 6 and 8, he said, he sternly uh, warned him not to take Isaac back to the country. It says here on uh, Genesis 24, um, be careful never to take back my son there, Abraham told him. But if a woman is not willing to come back to you, you will be free of this oath of mine. But you, must, you, but you must not take my son back there. Jacob fled to the old country for 20 years to escape Esau's uh, murderous intent. But it was never his true homeland. He told Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place to my own country. The application is that as believers, we must make a break, we must make a break from our old life, from, um, from the old world, from the world. We must, we lived in the world, but we cannot be of the world. Often like the Or of Chaldees, the world is sophisticated and modern. The church seems old fashioned, and out of touch with the latest trend, especially when we face hardship because our faith. We may be tempted to go back to the world, but to do so would be turn away from God's promises in Christ. We cannot go back. Why not? Why not? Because of ch chapter uh, verse 16, which is the second point of this uh, message. We who lived and die according to faith, seek and desire a better country in heaven that is prepared by God for us. Now, there are four aspects on this verse that we can touch briefly. Number one is a better country, the prepared city, the desired that seeks, and our God that who is not ashamed. Now, the better country is heaven. We cannot answer many of our questions about heaven, but we can know for certain that it will be a far better than the best existence that we imagine on this earth. Every problem that we face on this earth is the result of the fall of the human race into sin. But in heaven, there will be no curse, no death, no sorrow, no pain, no disease. Just think of all the businesses and jobs that will not be needed in heaven. No doctors or nurses, because there are no diseases. No policemen or armed forces, because there are no crimes. There are no wars. Heaven will be beyond. Heaven will be beyond our imagination. The best way to to uh, paint this picture is when Jesus said that heaven will have uh, golden streets. Just imagine a street made of gold. 
So if the street is made of gold, how much more are the other things? The walls, the gates are made of precious stones. The clear river of the water of life flowing through it are mer merely earthly pictures to give us dim idea of how magnificent it will be. I remember the first time I, I entered the Grand, uh, the Grand Mosque, it was beautiful. The precious stones in car, engraved or in the, in the walls, it's something that is the first, when you saw it, you will be amazed. But, it's, but heaven, it is much more than this. It is a uh, hundred times better than this. And the best of all, the best of all, as written in, the, in uh, Revelations 21, verse 3, the best part of heaven is, is that God himself will dwell among us. He will dwell us uh, among us, his people, and there will be no more uh, no need for sun or moon because the glory of God will illumine it all time. The other one is the prepared city is for us. Now, the better country and the prepared city is the same things, viewed from a different perspective. This is the heavenly city with foundation whose architect and builder is God. Just imagine it. If you see, the first time I see Burj Khalifa, I marveled at how tall it is. When I come near it, it was humongous. It was of great magnitude. The architect, the engineer who have uh, made that is something. But just think about it. But here in heaven, God is the architect. God is the builder. Many Christians envision heaven as a beautiful country estate secluded in all privacy from all neighbors. But the Bible pictures heaven as a city. We think of cities as dirty, polluted, crowded, random places with graffiti defacing everything. But the heavenly city will be pristine and indescribably beautiful. Earthly cities are dangerous because of high crime rate. But the heavenly city will be without sin. In earthly cities, you will put up difficult neighbors and rude strangers. But the heavenly city will be a place of close, sweet fellowship with those who filled with love of Christ. Since it will be an eternal city, we will never press for time. And since God prepared it for us, it will be perfectly suited to all our needs. The desire to seek heaven stems uh, from faith. Verse 14, it says there that the pilgrims are seeking a country of their own. Verse 16 said they are desiring a better country. When you fall in love, you seek to be with your beloved because you desire her company. These are strong motivational words. Now, we all have that friend who we want to hang out with, who we want to spend time with, but they are busy with their life. They are busy doing their school, their work, their project, that uh, they can spare, just they cannot even spare a few minutes of their time uh, for us. Then they fall in love. And it's simply uh, amazing how suddenly they have hours every day to spend with their with uh with the girl that they fall in love with because they seek they seek they seek her because of the desire we are to seek heaven because we desire to be with jesus the lovers of our souls if you are not rearranging your best uh, busy schedule so that you can see the things above where christ is you need to examine your heart we need to examine our heart Maybe we may have left your love, first love for the Savior. Or our love for Christ is not that uh, big as we thought of. So we need to think about that. The God who is not ashamed for us is our God. Because they, these patriarchs deserve the heavenly country. Therefore, God is what is this here? Uh, says here on verse 16, that God is not ashamed of them to be called their God. 
Now, uh, the idea of God being ashamed is startling, but it, it is a figure of speech using a negative mean, uh, negative to mean the positive, like it's uh, it's not a bad looking car, which means it's a good car. It's a nice looking car. That uh, it says here that God is pleased to be called their God. But even in this uh, startling, uh, when God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Even though these men were far far uh, from perfect, God was pleased to identify with them. In fact, God is, more, uh, is most often called the God of Jacob. And if you if you rank this, uh, you, you rank these three, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob is the least of them. But God is often called the God of Jacob. So it gives us uh, hope for us that even though we are sinner, that God can be called uh, the God of us. John writes in First uh, John 3, verse 1 to 3, see how great the love of uh, see how great a love the Father has be bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet that we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because he will see him just as he is. Then he applies the glorious truth, and everyone who has hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Jonathan Edwards has a wonderful sermon titled The Christian Pilgrim, and uh, let me read that quote for you the, on what he said. God is the highest good of the reasonable creature. The enjoyment of him is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wife and children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows, but the enjoyment of God is the substance. So as we continue to work here in the UAE, because this is the, as of now, this is the better place for us. And soon we will continue to move forward soon uh, in, uh, in the near future. We will have another better earthly uh, place for us. Let us remember that, that, let us ask God that to open our eyes to the beauty of the better place, the better country, which is in heaven, which is heaven. Ask him to fill your vision with the beauty of Jesus so that, so that with the psalmist, with the psalmist in Psalm 73, 25, 26, you can testify. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh, my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone! In 1 Chronicles 16.8, it says, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people. The song that I will be singing is entitled, Every Time I Speak His Name. It talks about the adversities that arise and we are caught in tough situations. But we have the assurance of a great God whose name is exalted and above all. There are uncertainties, doubts, fears, and sorrows, but God reminds us of His greatest love. And when we seek Him, He will find us. 
May this song enlighten our hearts with God's amazing and overflowing love that encompasses all understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes, Lord. Help us open our eyes. Help us to seek you, to desire for you, so that we may, at the end of the day, at the end of our life, we desire the better country, which is heaven. Be with us tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>